Good afternoon, I'm Bob Vavra, Content Manager for CFE Media, and I'll be moderating a discussion today of our three winners of the ninth System Integrator of the Year Awards. We're very pleased to have these distinguished gentlemen with us and thank them for coming in to talk with us this afternoon. Uh, on my right is Charlie Jager, the president of Polytron Inc. from Duluth, Georgia. Next to him is Paul Gleski, the chairman and CEO of Maverick Technologies in Columbia, Illinois. And finally, uh, Steve Melisco, president and CEO of Melisco en Engineering in St. Louis. Gentlemen, thank you all for coming in today and first of all, congratulations on winning the System Integrator of the Year Award. Um, let's talk about integration as it, in its purest term. What makes for a successful system integration project between you and your, your customer? You know, how do you get the most out of them and how do they get the most out of you? You want me to start? Char okay. Please, yeah. Charlie. I, I think that um, there, there are a num number of elements that, that you need to um, have to have a successful project and a collaboration. You need to start off with a good process. But I, I, I focus on what sometimes and many times is left out. And I think probably the most important factor to focus on is alignment. You have your, you know, you have your project um, goal set, your final project objectives. You've got your design, and but many times um, you you can lose out on the human alignment. And what I mean with, by that is that you need to get everybody together and communicate with them so that you have your your client is there, team of your client, uh, the team from Polytron is there and also uh, some of our technology providers are there. And you need to keep them constantly aligned on, on that goal. It, it's much like a, a football team being prepared uh, for, for, you know, for a game. Paul, how about you? Well, I think I'd second what Charlie said. It's really important to set mutual expectations up front with all stakeholders, and not necessarily just the engineering component of the end user, but their operations people, and bring those people all together in a, in a kickoff and write those expectations down and have a clear agreement on what success looks like and then deliver that success. And I think we've all found that most integration projects fail not for technical reasons, but for people interaction reasons, because of just the complexity of multiple organizations uh, interacting. So if those things are really set clearly up front, uh, chances are pretty good you'll get a good project at the end. Yeah, uh, Steve, technology doesn't have an ego, so that's yeah. one of the things that, that Paul's alluding to. But how do you get that that kind of collaboration at the at the very beginning? You've got a lot of people who if they haven't done a project like this before, maybe uncertain about how it's actually going to look. Well, <clears throat> the part about uh, working with people who maybe have not done, done it before has become even more and more acute. Um, you know, both of the statements before were absolutely 100% correct and, and completely accurate. But what we're finding these days is because of the um, intense reduction in manpower, you know, people leave, people retire, people die, people move on. They're not replacing people. And, and so what happens is a lot of times where a, a person who is a production supervisor, production manager, all of a sudden becomes a project manager mm -hmm. of, of a technical project. And, and so it becomes extremely critical. And, and this is where the integrator has to, they have to be proactive. Uh, you know, almost from a self-preservation standpoint to make sure that uh, they, the, the system integrator, go ahead and, and put forth the effort to sit down with the person who possibly, as you said, who may not, not have ever done a project before and say, okay, this is, this is what we need. This is the information we need. This is the, the, the in, in this timeline, uh, when your upper management tells you that you have to have this new product or this new widget out the door in eight months, well, here, let's back up, the, let's back up, and, and by the time you get all the way back to the very inception of the project, then all of a sudden uh, you, you finally get to, okay, now if we're going to get to that goal eight months from now, then here's what we need to do, here's who we need to get engaged right now. And, and it, bec it has become a more acute challenge than uh, I know certainly than we've ever seen it in, in our 20 years. Sure. And, and you know, one of the reasons the integration market has grown and grown so rapidly is that 
uh, dearth of talent in a lot of manufacturing organizations. They don't have the people they can bring on full time to tackle these kind of projects on a continuing basis. But then that puts the the onus back on the integrator to be able to find that talent and develop it. So let's talk about that for a moment. And I'll, I'll start with you, Steve, because you, you, you mentioned it just a second ago. Besides that technical skill, which you know you're looking for, what else are you looking for uh, in an integrator, in a, an employee for you, and what are you looking for beyond their technical skills that are going to help them do this job? Uh, many different things. Uh, you know, and, and it is a great question, uh, and because a talent pool it, 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 it seems to shrink, but yet uh, we know that there are a lot of people out there. The, for people in the integration industry, you not only have to have extremely talented people, but you have to have people who are people, mm -hmm. who can communicate properly, who can um, be good team members, who can be conversant and feel comfortable with talking uh, with um, not only their own peers, but, but with clients but not necessarily talk techie, you know, who, who do feel comfortable trying to take what is, is, is highly technical, highly scientific information sometime and try and break it down into something that a, say, a quality, a, a quality technician could, could understand or, or an operator can understand that it, be, it becomes a real challenge to find those type of people. So, you know, uh, some exist, uh, a, lot, a lot don't. But that's, but that's the real key to uh, our successes these days. Paul, your people have had a, uh, your company's had a tremendous growth uh, curve over the last few years. How are you finding both the talent that you're finding in the marketplace as well as some of these other skills that we're talking about? Well, we're just having to proactively train for these things and training for the soft skills and trying to get people to understand our culture and make sure we promulgate that culture as we've grown. That's very easy to lose. So we spend a lot of time in working with the workforce and making sure they know they're empowered and not just do engineering, but how to be an engineer and how to behave in a manufacturing environment and set those expectations up front that that's how Maverick folks, here's how we work and here's our uh, levels of behavior, et cetera. But it's a challenge and it doesn't happen accidentally. I mean, you've got to have a plan and then execute that training plan. And, and it's, it's, as I, I think Steve pointed out, it's not just talking to the line workers and even the supervisors, it's talking to the CFO, to some of the other people in the organization and be able to be conversant at a level that they can understand and give them the information they need all the way up and down the organization. Oh, absolutely, and the engineers that want to talk with three-letter acronyms and all those kind of things, that may be good when they're in an engineering environment, but they get with the plant manager and the financial people and those kind of folks, that's not what they want to hear. They want plain speak and uh, so they can understand really what the business challenges are being faced. Charlie, you're, you're based out of, uh, out of Georgia, and, and the South and the Southeast has had a tremendous uh, resurgence of the engineering schools. I mean, you've got Georgia Tech to start with, but all throughout the, the Mid-South and the Deep South, there have been a lot of great engineering schools. What's your recruitment process look like, and how are you uh, finding the talent pool that is available to your organization? Well, uh, listening to Steve and Paul, it, it certainly is evident we're in the same business and experience the same problem. And the, the, the talent pool, uh, it, the talent we need is, is rare. It's becoming rare. Um, I've made this may be an exaggeration, but I've told many of our uh, uh, people at, in, in our in our company that um, out of a hundred electrical engineers that graduate from good schools, there may be only three that are suited for our industry. And 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 the, you ask about the non-technical skill. The one uh, thing that I look for that I think is important is the passion for what we do. And and. Uh, it, you know, you can be a you can be a great engineer or a great ball player or whatever, but if you don't have the passion for what we do, uh, you, you're you're not going to uh, you know uh, c contribute in, in the in the long term, and and it, it, this recruiting is really uh, uh, becoming difficult. We've had to make some philosophical changes in our own recruiting. Um, we, we we have a very disciplined recruiting process where there's a test and and so forth. But it's becoming harder to find people. We've had to open up uh, and use uh, recruiters that we haven't used in the past. We actually have, Polytron has a, now we have a training department. And we have used that training department and, uh, not only for our, our customers, but also to onboard people, as, pa as Paul just pointed out, 
Uh, I think going forward, we're going to have to train the people. We, we, we won't be able to rely on uh, even Georgia Tech or Clemson. And, uh, I mean, as for that matter, we go, uh, we, 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 don't, we focus on the southeast because that's where we are, but we'll go uh, to any, any good school in, in the country. But in the end, we're going to have to do uh, some training. And in the end, that person has to have a passion uh, for, the, for this business. From your perspectives, how do you stay uh, up to speed on the emerging technologies from your w within the needs of your uh, customer base, but also from the supplier base? And Paul, what are you doing in terms of going out and gathering knowledge about the next big thing that's coming down the line? We place a lot of emphasis on thought leadership, and that's really our, our mantra is we want to be on the cutting edge of things and really the forefront of the industry. And with that, we've got technology leaders in each discipline uh, that are out looking for what the next thing is, looking what the next generation of control systems look like, uh, really looking at technology beyond just traditional uh, manufacturing space with big data and Internet of Things and all those things, uh, mobile applications, because those things are creeping into the uh, automation space even more rapidly. So we tend to just, let's get out of the automation space a little bit and look back and see how some of these other things are going to impact that in the long term. Charlie, how about you? What do you see some of the, uh, the ways you go about finding out what's, uh, what's on the cutting edge of uh, both your customer needs and your supplier base? Well, that's, that's a great question because um, I think all of us can agree that in our business, since we, we are the core of our business is computers and that kind of technology, it, is, it, it changes rapidly. And, and we have to keep up. I mean, uh, more so than uh, other industries, our people have to keep up. Uh, you know, we change computers, it seemed like, every three or four years. I, you know, I don't, I don't understand it, but we, we have to buy new computers every three or four years. Yeah. What we do is, um, again, we rely, uh, I, I talked about the passion. Uh, we, our, our people have to be in a continuing learning uh, 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 mode. And Polytron, we try to create an environment for learning. Uh, we have in-house seminars. Our training department really creates uh, you know, training for our people. The other thing that needs to be done, we have to stay in contact with our technology providers, mm -hmm. who are they, who, who, whoever they are, uh, the, the PLC manufacturers, the uh, HMI manufacturers, the, the software manufacturers. We have to stay in touch with them to see where they're going and get, and get ahead of the curve and to get some advanced information. And of course, we have to stay in touch with the uh, customers. So we try to, uh, because they are also, their need drives the technology. Mm -hmm. So we have to know what the, what the next phase is going to be. So maintain those close relationships with the uh, customer, with our technology providers, and also cre maintaining this learning, constant learning environment uh, I'm sure that, um, you know, Paul and Steve does the same thing. We try to encourage our people to get a, a professional engineer's license. It, not that we need it in our industry, but it makes them uh, study and come up to speed and, 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 and maintain their, their, their credentials and their, and their knowledge. It's very difficult, but it's, it's a very critical thing to keep, stay ahead and keep, or keep up with this emerging technology in, in our industry. Wanna, yeah, go ahead. I, no, I just one one of the other uh, aspects too is, um, and, and I think we've all heard the, the the old phrase, you know, leading edge, not bleeding edge. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the, especially our the the clients who develop who we develop long term relationships with, they they ask us almost like you know on on a routine basis when they see some new technology. They kind of always bounce it off of us. What do you think about this? Mm -hmm. And 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 there's a, a a very high degree of responsibility that we take on because I, I liken it to, um, you know, especially in the world of technology, it's it's just like some of these technologies come out and it's analogous to the next uh, fad diet. Mm -hmm. Okay, here to you know today today it's this fad diet and in two weeks later it'll be some other no 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 we got a better fad diet yeah. of losing weight and and uh you know uh the same thing happens in our technology and uh you know fortunately and i think and i think probably all of us have the seasoned veterans who have been around so like like you mentioned charlie about we're all in computers and 
you know, we have the networking, we have the big data, and, um, you know, if you look at any publication, you look on anywhere on the internet, there, there's all of these different solutions, and uh, we, we, don't have a, a, we don't have a drought of solutions. We have an overflow of solutions. So then the customers come up, come to us, and, and they say, um, Mr. Integrator, will you help me sift through the, you know, the, help me find the right answer for me? Yeah. And and that's a th that's a, re a responsibility, a tremendous responsibility that for that that gets that gets put on the shoulders of the integrators. Mm -hmm. um, it, it and it's a, it's a it's a great feeling, but also too it it it, it brings on tremendous responsibilities, mm -hmm. and that and that's why uh, it's always so important for us to have good quality technical people with that that don't just run off and and chase the next bright butterfly of technology mm -hmm. that they that they have a good solid foundation that can think through what you know okay does this make sense does this make sense for my client and and will it will it be that that diet that works even yeah. six months or six years from now steve i mean steve makes a good point this is a great point because um it uh, in the end we uh, our our customers are investing in in a system uh, and the bottom line is this system has to have a return on this investment. And uh, when, you, uh, when you're in the leading edge, you, you have to be, I think, you know, Steve was uh, alluding to this. You have to make sure that you don't, you move the, your customer ahead far enough so they can stay in the technology, but not so far that, that they are high risk for some uh, fad uh, technology. Sure. Uh, that, is, that has happened in, in the past. Some of our major pro providers have come up, I remember, you know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, large companies with, with, with solutions that ended up, to me, being failures. And, and you put your clients at risk if you, you latch onto these fads. So... We really do have to to analyze the investment potential of of these systems and recommend that to our client and not put them at at risk. Paul, this is a good point because what kind of relationship do you have to have with the technology providers to be able to say, "Here's what my customers are telling us we need. Do you have a solution for this, or can we point you toward a solution that needs to be developed?" for this problem that we're seeing coming up with a, with a number of our clients. Well, in an ideal world, that would be a closed loop solution, mm -hmm. but uh, in practice, not, only, not always is that, you know, we see, we all see the demands and needs of the plant floor requirements every day and not quite honestly, not every automation manufacturer wants to listen to those. They've got their own agenda and their own platform to move forward. So whenever you can get close to an OEM and show them what you've learned and share that with them and if they'll <laughs> studiously take that information and where it makes sense include in their product man you can really move ahead quickly steve do you, do you see yourself having more influence now as you've as the universe has started to grow for system integrators and you've been taking on more and more of these kinds of projects do you feel like your influence is growing in that area and what more needs to happen it, it, um, i wouldn't say so much maybe influence but maybe getting their ear more you know it um, you know, as Paul said, you know, they, uh, OEMs, they, they'll have the, their own, you know, may have their own agenda, and um, you always hope that uh, what, what you're trying to deliver to the client, uh, it, you know, it synchronizes with what the OEM or OEMs, you know, have, have to offer. Um, but what we are finding, though, is that, uh, you know, just by, by us Working hard, you know, work, you know, putting together very sound systems, and and trying to offer feedback to not only what works, but but hey, you might want to try uh, making this little tweak or that little tweak. Um, you know, we we are finding that we're maybe at least getting more attention. You know, and and so with and also too with some of the work that we've been that we've been doing to that that the uh, some of the OEMs are taking notice and say, oh, hey, by the way, you know, what do you think about this and what do you think about that? It, it's it's flattering um, and and it's nice that that they're uh, asking integrators, you know, what what do you think? Because um, you know, many there are integrators. I'm sorry, there are OEMs out there who will say that. Um, and they will openly admit, they will say, when it comes to the technology that we, the OEM, 
develop, d deliver to the client, to the integrator. We know our product better than anybody else. And you know what? We, we, have, we won't refute that at all. Or we won't even debate that. But then what they'll say is, but you integrators, you live with the clients. You live in the trenches. You know what they need and what they like and what they don't like. So we're going to listen to you about the application of our technologies. And, that, and that's something that we, we, we've been seeing with, with uh, a number of the OEMs o over the last, say, five or seven years. And that's, that's very, very healthy all the way around. Let, let's talk about the, the market. We've all talked about the strength of the market, but where geographically are we seeing some of the, the big run-ups and in what specific vertical markets? I mean, we'll start with oil and gas because everybody has seen oil and gas just really uh, being a very aggressive market, but what are you seeing in that market and where geographically in the U.S. are we seeing uh, that growth uh, besides the Southeast? Are there some other places that... Uh, uh, the oil and gas market is doing well. Well, let's, I, if we're going to talk about the oil and gas. I'm going to defer to to, to Paul uh, if you want to talk sure. specifically about about that. Uh, if, but with respect to uh, geographic uh, markets, um, really, uh, what what drives our focus as far as market is not geography. I mean, there are certain parts of the country that you don't have any manufacturing plants, and there are some where they have a lot. But what drives it is where the customer is investing. And there is an investing, a uh, capital investment cycle that goes on. And um, so I, I, we really, at Polytron, we don't focus on a geography. We're finding, we, you know, it's where our customers are investing. Uh, you know, uh, in, in 2000, we were working in Chicago here, okay? Uh, we have, and then it took us 10 years before we got back. So it's not, it's not the geography, it, to me, it's the in, in investment, uh, uh, in the, the, the investment cycle. Now, with respect to the Southeast, we, we are headquartered in the Southeast, um, and this, this happens at various places in the country. There's a lot of infrastructure uh, improvements that are going on. For instance, you know, the Panama Canal has been uh, expanded. So there are going to be these larger ships coming through. Well, what happened in the ports of Charleston, South Carolina, and Savannah, uh, those ports now are, are being deepened. And um, it's specifically so that there can be more exporting. We have BMW up in the upstate of South Carolina. They're building an inland port there, 200 miles away from Charleston Port, up in the upstate of South Carolina, for BMW, Michelin, to transport their goods by rail quickly down to the port in Charleston. Well, this infrastructure change is not only going to help that automotive industry, which is Michelin and, uh, and, and BMW, but all manufacturing will be able to ship that. So we can anticipate that this market is going to occur, and it, and it already has. But I, I think Paul is better yeah. at, in the oil and gas. I'd like to, you know, Paul to, to, to just talk about the oil and gas market down there. Well, it's obviously no secret that um, LNG is... Uh, the next big thing mm -hmm. and that that's here to stay and that impacts everything so right now in the gulf coast there's a tremendous amount of petrochem investment because of going to be a cheaper raw material theoretically uh to make petrochemicals out of uh, a lot of that's coming from the northeast pennsylvania is a, a very hot area and then the upper midwest but what's going to happen i think is this first wave is with petrochemicals and derivatives downstream from there, though, everybody's utilities are going to get cheaper as the price of gas goes down. And if you're burning gas in your manufacturing facility, uh, the cost of that's going to go down. So I think there will be a residual wave after the first wave here getting into the rest of the manufacturing uh, base that's really going to be helpful to the country. I mean, the United States is very, very well positioned by virtue of this LNG. Mm -hmm. um, a little concerned with the price of oil going down to $79 a barrel today that may impact that investment or slow it down. Mm -hmm. But long term, it's a game changer here. And uh, most of that's on the Gulf Coast and in the Northeast from what we've seen. Beyond the, uh, uh, the refining process and the transportation process, do you start to see retrofitting in plants? Looking at, uh, at LNG as a a larger fuel source and what that does to their facilities? Yeah, larger. We're seeing a lot of uh, peaking stations that are uh, natural gas conversions. And also the whole notion of, of cracking 
uh, LNG instead of oil is a big, big deal, and there's tens, hundreds of billions of dollars going in on the Gulf Coast, Texas and Louisiana primarily. It's a big, big deal. And you want to talk about a labor shortage, that's it down there. It's a very uh, tight workforce, and we're getting a lot of labor inflation pressures and things of that nature. Absolutely. Yeah. Steve, what do you say? Yeah, I, I think, uh, in addition to that, I, I think um, that manufacturing is going to increase throughout the entire country. We, we see a lot of it in, in the Midwest and also in parts of the West. But I, I was, I've, I've recently had conversations with, with um, clients who have said that they're moving, they are actually ex going to expand plants here, moving manufacturing back from Mexico because labor now is on the rise and the whole, you know, made one of the major reasons for moving to Mexico was because of the cheap labor, but labor is not so cheap anymore. And so now there, there are companies that are moving back the, uh, their manufacturing. So they're, the, along with the manufacturing moving back, there, there's the natural inclination to upgrade to increase efficiency, increase operational output, so there's plenty of opportunities for our integrators. It's, it's been an interesting process of watching manufacturing evolve from something that was leaving as fast as it could to getting back as fast as it could, and it really is a much more complex issue than just wage costs. And, you, know, you mentioned energy, which is just a huge yeah. driver of a, a lot of the uh, the growth we've seen over the last five years, uh, manufacturing has grown steadily the last five and a half years in, uh, in the U.S. Um, so that's got to be an, an exciting opportunity to see manufacturing, which you've all spent a lot of years promoting, really not just a revival, but really a leadership role, both in the U.S. economy and in the global economy. Uh, it, it's got to be an exciting time. It really is, and in spite of no real national policy to promote manufacturing, we're still winning, which yeah. is kind of surprising. If we ever got out of our own way, we'd be pretty dangerous as a com country. We've had three different customers move manufacturing back from Southeast Asia uh, for reliability reasons, for intellectual property reasons. There's a lot of good, good reasons why you want to do business in the United States these days. Yeah. Let's talk about, uh, uh, look out a little further beyond even today. What are the changes your customers need to be prepared for, both from a technology standpoint and from a, uh, an operational standpoint in the next few years, uh, both what they're going to manufacture, how they're going to do it, and how technology and the changes we've seen in technology are, are going to be impacted. Uh, uh, Charlie, let's start with you. What, what's the, the, the thing that you're kind of looking at down the road and you're counseling your customers to look at. Well, I, um, you know, re reflecting on both what Paul and, and Steve has said previously, our customers have the same problem with, with talent and is going to have more problems because the, uh, we're going to have a lot of people retiring here. It's or it has already started. Uh, those skills and that knowledge has been used. You know, if you've got 30 years of knowledge, um, you can compensate for, let's say, uh, a, a, a control system that maybe doesn't give all the information. Well, what's going to happen is we're going to have to, be, as this knowledge leaves, we're going to have to train uh, new people. And this is the reason Polytron, uh, w one of the things that Polytron is doing is we have this training unit. And, and you're, you're going to have to have, from the system integration, from the technology uh, point, uh, more information available to allow these uh, new people who maybe not be as skilled to, to actually show uh, exact the information have shown exactly where the problem is and how to fix the, the line when it when it goes down uh, the, the the other area that I it, we, we're talking about five years I think you know in five years this uh, safety machine safety and plant safety as is uh, very uh, important it we, we've already, it's always, always been uh, significant because we, we want our workers not to get injured and we don't have any fatalities. But now there's a lot of studies that's confirmed that uh, safe plants are more productive and more profitable. Yep. So, uh, so there's a business case for, for safety. And um, we, we see that uh, coming, and Polytron has a, a safety uh, unit, a, a group, 
that focuses on, on uh, these uh, safe PLCs and also safe uh, safety procedures. So that's the uh, second uh, thing I see coming in five years. And of course, there's, there's this ongoing uh, uh, renovation and improvement of uh, hardware and software. And it, it may not happen in five years, it may be longer out, but we're, we've already started the, uh, the customization. There's gonna be more customization of products. In other words, the products are not just gonna be standard uh, products. You know, there's gonna be, uh, customers are gonna be able to design their own product. And with that, that customization, it, there's going to be opportunity for system integration and a need to uh, connect these ERP software with the uh, uh, with the supply chain software in such a way that we can that, that our customers can read what the customer wants in their product, the the, the 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 enhancements and so forth, and then to produce it. So the, that customization, that is, building a product for you not just for this mass of people, mm -hmm. is going to be a great opportunity for, for systems integrated. So I, I would say the, um, the, the retirement of, of the workforce is number one, a safety, number two, and then uh, this customization that this has already started, a, a product customization. That is building a product for an individual. Very good. Paul, what else? Well, to build on what Charlie said, the, you know, the one constant in manufacturing is the ever-increasing velocity of change. We've got to move more quickly. We've got to be able to effectively deploy a dollar of CapEx better, cheaper, faster than ever before, because as the economy changes and everything is more customized, as Charlie would say, and not a single one-off things, I mean, if you look at additive manufacturing, 3D printing, that's really customizable stuff there. And that's on its way in a big way. So we as engineers have to find not only better technical ways to implement projects, but to effectively get that capital deployed quickly and effectively and strategically when and where the customers need it. Yeah. I, you know, you, we, we talked about the, the manufacturing policy, but really one of the things that has accelerated, I think, growth over the last number of years is the speed with which integrators uh, product suppliers, manufacturers have made these changes on their own and have recognized that by reducing the cost structure of whatever there is they're doing and increasing the productivity, to Charlie's point, we've been able to find tremendous savings and tremendous uh, opportunity to, uh, to con continue to grow manufacturing. I think it's been a really exciting time to solve a lot of those problems. No question. And, and bringing real-time data yeah. uh, where it needs to be yeah. in context. Yeah. But, in, but uh, to your point, though, uh, you know, num a number of the OEMs recognized that, and they made the upfront investment. They, you know, they recognized that that's where they needed to be. They made the initial investment. The challenge that we see on a routine basis is working with some of the uh, uh, second-tier uh, manufacturers, you know, cl clients, and saying, okay, here's all this technology. Here's what it's going to do for you. Here's what you need to prepare for. And yes, it is going to cost money, but if you know, it's almost if you don't do it now, then two years from now, when you're when when you're behind and you're you're losing sales because you know you're you're you have uh, the quality isn't there, you're getting too many uh, complaints, um, and and you don't know why. You know you can't you can't go back through and and uh, find out what was the root cause of your problems. Well. Don't come to us then and say, "Okay, now, now I want the technology tomorrow," you know, because a lot of this, uh, a lot of this in, uh, infrastructure does uh, take a, uh, a sizable capital investment, but it also takes time, and and that's something that sometimes uh, some of our clients don't realize until it's too late. So the the challenge for the future. It, uh, for the integrators is is for us to at the same time saying yes we can help deliver the technology we almost have to help them build a business case for making that investment which is which is going to be considerable yeah I think the the point that Charlie made was about accelerating the supply chain if you don't get in on that supply chain now if you're tier one tier two in a lot of industries and you're not making that investment today and tomorrow you're going to get left behind when the when the acceleration comes down. And for the first time in six or seven years, manufacturers seem to both have the will and the capital to be able to spend on these kinds of projects. Uh, 
are, are you seeing both of those kinds of things, Paul, right now that they've got they, they've got a little extra money lying around and a little extra incentive to, to try and invest it in the right places? Yeah, I, I do see that, but I also am also amazed that uh, large companies not being able to pull the trigger mm-hmm. and really invest when projects are obviously a, a good project. You know, what Steve was saying is we got to be able to help our customers develop projects and develop a strategic technology plan for manufacturing and we're doing a lot of that and sometimes uh, I'm surprised that they don't embrace it quite as quickly as they could. Yeah, I, I, I've just seen that it's uh, the, the last IMTS show we had here in Chicago, uh, Doug Woods, who's the president of AMT, said to me, we've got guys walking in here with seven-figure uh, uh, purchase orders ready to ready to pull the trigger on some new technology and that was the the last of the really good encouraging signs that I had heard that manufacturing was really ready to accelerate and with some of the things we've already talked about with business coming back and and uh, being right shore to to the US where it where it needs to be uh, we seem to have some real real growth potential for the for the next year how are your how's your company getting prepared for that and and what do you need to do for the next five years well, again, we our, our training and keep, keeping our people abreast of, uh, of technology. Uh, uh, again, keeping in touch with our customers and, and with with our technology providers uh, are, you know, are, are critical. I, but I I think that um, just learning uh, and. And, and keeping in touch and learning about these new technologies and, 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 and trying to look ahead at what, what the changes are going to be. You, you, can't, you can't spend too much time in the, in the future because, uh, I mean, you know, like Steve says, there, there are a bunch of fads out there and, and you, can get, you can get locked in and fooled by some of these things. You have to be realistic, mm-hmm. uh, analyze realistic, and, but, but then again, you, you, you have to take some leap forward to keep your, keep your customers um, a, 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 a ahead. And um, a, again, it goes back to uh, training that we, we are trying to do for our customers and for, and for ourselves, and I think that's probably one of the most important aspects. Okay. Paul, what about you? Uh, in order to meet demand, we've made a huge commitment next year to hire 30 new grade engineers proactively. Uh, we just got to go build the next generation. There are enough trained professionals out there that we can hire. So with that, we've put together a very robust onboarding program as well as a six-month boot camp to take these new bright engineers that don't have manufacturing experience and turn them into automation engineers. So we're going to build our own. Very good. So yeah, and it's a combination of uh, bringing in you know the green people and also, too, trying to find people with experience. Um, but also, too, uh, you know, again, you talked about uh, the relationships with OEMs. Fi- try to find out, try to look under their tent and say, you know, lift up the tent cover and say, hey, what do you see? What do you have coming on? What, what, what's going to be out there six months from now, a year from now? What, do you, what are you planning? And, and that's where the great relationship with, with the OEMs really come, comes into play. It's a combination of all of the above. I, I guess if, if one of us had the, the magic answer, we'd be all a lot farther in our careers than we are. Uh, but but it, it's, it's a combination of all of those. And the heck of it is, too, is that, is that you know, um, no one has the crystal ball that's going to tell us where we're, you know what's going to be going on in two years from now. All we can do is do the best we can of, of hiring good people, bringing on and training good people, as Paul was saying, and Charlie was saying, and in and, and doing and doing what we can to to prepare for the future. And, and that brings us all the way back around to where we started, which was collaboration, with the ability for all of you to understand your customer base, to understand what's going on in the OEM market, what's going on in the end user market, what's going on in your own engineering shop, the cool ideas you all are coming up with, and then be able to bring those solutions back out to the industry. And and that's very indicative of why uh, each of your companies were uh, selected for the System Integrator of the Year Award, and we're very pleased to be honoring all three of you with this award this year. For CFE Media, I'm Bob Vavre. I want to thank our, our panelists for this discussion, and uh, thanks for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.